Hi, my name is Dave and today I'm going to give you a look at this beautiful 6.5 centimeter Nippon Kogaku telescope from 1957. We know for sure what date it is because in the box there's a little sticker that says uh, import approved 1957. <clears throat> this telescope has many many uh, very interesting and superb features. First of all the optics are beautiful. Uh, Nikon is uh, very reputable and is known for producing the finest optics on the planet comparable to Zeiss. So I'll give you some close-ups and explain some of the nice features of this very unique interesting and quirky telescope. I love a quirky telescope and uh, Nippon Kogaku and uh, Goto may have been in some sort of competition for who could make the strangest or most innovative telescope mounts, uh, telescope systems, very strange, very interesting uh, sort of experimental things coming out of both of those companies back in the 1950s, maybe 19 early 60s. Um, anyway, I'll show you some nice close-up features of this scope and I uh, hope you enjoy my little tour. Okay, let me show you what this looks like in the box. Um, first of all, it's got complete instruction manual, original, a couple little wrenches. There's the little tag that says uh, export standard 1957. This is the counterweight right here. This device here is the sun projection screen mounting system. I'll show you that on the scope. Here's the two screens in the box. Here's a couple of eyepieces. There's a 25 millimeter Huygens. This is a 9 millimeter Ortho, and that is a 18 millimeter Huygens over there. This is an image erecting system. So this is the little projection device to be used as a finder. I'll show you that in a close-up here in a moment. All right, let me give you a close-up look at some of these features. Um, I absolutely love Goto and Nippon Kogaku. Both of them are quite rare. Uh, this one is one of the strangest interesting mount systems ever. Uh, this device here, you can see that this is working like a ball head on a camera mount might work. It is somewhat limited. You can't twist this right ascension axis, but it's almost exactly the same thing. This little lever here squeezes a ball up onto the, or squeezes a cup onto this ball, which then engages it, locks it up nice and tight. Uh, and it's, it's very effective. It works just fine. Okay, now I've got it set up for a close-up of that uh, sort of strange ball system. This clamp here locks it and unlocks it, and it's actually very, very good, very effective. It locks it up really, really tight. Um, there's a wrench inside that will tighten up these things, so you can adjust that if you need to, but it's, uh, it's, it's very effective. One of the cool things about this is that you can turn it this way. You can go up and down like this, so you can change this is theoretically the Altaz mode, um, and apparently your latitude is somewhat limited. You couldn't go too far north. I don't even know if this would work in Alaska. Um, so you've got a limited amount of latitude control with this, uh, but you can easily adjust it. So you could easily set it up after you put the telescope, put the tripod down, set it up and aim it at least pretty close to Polaris, which is all you're going to need for visual work like that. Just quick and quick and easy and very simple. Very, very nice and uh, extremely unique. Never seen anything else quite like that. But it also allows you to do this, which is one of the things that we're pushing for with this mount, was to be able to set it up as an Altaz type telescope. So that's what it says in the instruction book you're supposed to do. And I think it was Honestly, more of a selling feature rather than an actual practical device. And there are not many other telescopes that have such a thing. 
Zeiss has a similar possibility with their scope, but in their scope you tilt it all the way back like this. That's a bit more effective. But in this case you can take the counterweight off and use it like that. Eh. Uh, but it's still, it's <laughs> not exactly the most perfect system. But it's very, very interesting. Uh, it's incredibly quirky. Okay, I've got the telescope set up for uh, terrestrial observation now. This is the terrestrial image erecting eyepiece. And you can see the counterweight is, I've, I've removed the counterweight. And as long as you're in this position, it would probably work pretty darn well. You could look at things pretty successfully. If you get off this way though, it gets kind of weird because the axis is not exactly vertical anymore. But as long as you're looking in this direction, it would work quite well. So that's one of the interesting things about the scope. Uh, another thing is this little device here. This little device, I'll show you a close-up. That's a, a prism inside there. And when you look down in through the prism, you're looking along, and there's two gun sights on the telescope, right there and right there. And you can line this up perfectly so that you can actually see the two gun sights through there. Um, the only issue with that is then that you are required to pretty much keep this lined up with the tube. You can't rotate this or you're going to mess up the finder kind of system. So you have to rotate the whole tube, which is possible because you can loosen this up and rotate the entire tube in its cradle if you want to. A little, uh, little bit of a hassle. Very, very interesting, very strange, <laughs> bizarre kind of a little thing. And uh, absolutely charming, completely charming. Okay, so now I'm looking down through that little tiny prism, and this is a difficult shot to do with the camera, but I'm going to try and focus it differently so you can see what's going on. There's the back part of the gun sight, and there I'm coming in to focus on the front part of the gun sight on the front of the tube. And I'm all the time looking straight down through that little tiny prism. It's really kind of cute, kind of charming. Not really terribly practical, but a lot of fun. A lot of fun to have this system. Uh, let me show you the way this, the uh, slow motion right ascension works. Because this is, I think it's really kind of cool. Um, most of your observation with a scope of this size is going to be the moon and planets. And of course you can do... Um, double stars especially uh, quite well. Not too much deep sky. But one of the things that's nice about this is that when you configure this for observing something along the ecliptic, let me show you what that looks like. So we're now observing something somewhere on the ecliptic. And uh, you can see that this slow motion control is very, very, very convenient for me. And I might want to, you know, I'm probably going to, for my case, I'll probably do it something like that and ignore the little finder dealie. Um, so I would be observing the moon or whatever, and I've got, uh, I've got a lock over here so I can lock it in right ascension. When I walk down the right ascension, this thing now it gives me a limited, just a little bit. There's a little tangent arm system right in here that gives me just a tiny bit of tracking. It's enough. You could probably track for half an hour or so forth, uh, or maybe more before you have to rewind this thing. By the way, this is not original. This, if this looks funny to you, it's because this was designed for something a little bit different. Uh, it had a more of a ball shaped thing, but this is the same basic idea. So now you can track, and you've got tracking, which is very convenient. If you're looking at something at high magnifications, having just that little bit of tracking and right ascension makes a world of difference and makes it much easier, much more, much more pleasant. Okay, let me show you how this... This is the slow motion. You can see there's a little arm coming out of here, and that's clamped onto the right ascension axis. Here's a close-up of the repair I made. This part is not original. Uh, this was completely broken. I'll show you some pictures of that. This was completely broken off here. The uh, axle was broken 
and it was um, <clears throat> seriously damaged. I tried to repair it. It was impossible to repair the way it was. I had to build this. So I made this and I painted it and I think it looks pretty convincing. Of course, someone who knows these telescopes would know that's not original, but I think most other people would be fairly convinced by the paint job and so forth. Okay, now I have this set up for um, solar observation. This is a pretty unique kind of a system here. This clamps on. So there's a, a nice beefy, boy, this thing is well made. It's all made of uh, really strong material. This clamp just clamps on like so, locks on. Even the knobs here are uh, steel, they're metal. And they're very, very robust. They probably will not have survived since 1957 if they hadn't been. Uh, and they do have a, they ha have a little bit of rust, a little, little bit of surface rust on them, but pff, not bad for a 1957 telescope. Um, and this is a fairly standard kind of a system. One of the things that's interesting about this scope, top quality, inside here, it's not just the screw engaging, it's a, a clamping system like you have on, you know, the real fancy, high-priced, expensive eyepiece holders where it clamps a piece of brass on there. That's what they have for the solar screens. Unbelievable. Talk about fancy schmancy. That is fancy as you can get. Just for amusement, I thought you might like to see a comparison between the older Nippon Kagaku and its uh, descendant, the Nikon. These are both 6.5 centimeter, that is 65 millimeter telescopes, is the aperture. And for some reason, I do not understand why, that's the natural stance for both of those telescopes. The uh, Nikon was made on a very, very short tripod. Let me pan down so you can see that. They're both standing exactly where they're supposed to be. The Nikon, for some reason, and they're all made like this. This wasn't, you know, abnormal or anything. That's the way they were made. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed my tour of this charming Nippon Kagaku 6.5 centimeter telescope. Thank you.